me, but this is what you want to know about. If there's no tick mark, that was just one of you guys. And so maybe you can kind of see yours up here. If there's a tick mark, that was multiple people. Um, so want to know clouds, uh, more about clouds, hurricanes, two people, NATOs, tornadoes, right? Um, actually, we're four people. Um, just rotation in general. I think those, there were some really cool questions up here. Um, how do, like, uh, know the signs that the weather's going to be severe? Four of y'all, somewhere in your question, kind of asked that. Um, are there some benefits to severe weather? Um, digging towards the Earth's core. There are some cool documentaries out there about kind of, ex ex actually, the documentaries about life in weird places called extremophiles. There were just, not, not, I'm not going to start it, but there was just one recently in Antarctica with a core ice. There's a, giz, there's a little organism survived? Or? No, they dug down past the ice into a lake. Oh, I think I remember reading that. It's amazing. Yeah. It is amazing. Um, the whole thing about, when we talk about, um, talk about how, like, uh, the people at our forecast centers say what the weather's going to be like, honestly, animals know it before we do. That's true. <laughs> I have a little sheet that goes with that. And barometric pressure is one of the things that animals read to, to know what the weather's going to do. Magnetism's linked to uh, and polar shift. I kind of just put down keywords here. Um, how geological events um, maybe could be um, uh, understood or predicted based upon things happening in the atmosphere, that link, the geosphere and atmosphere. I think that's cool. A little more about the greenhouse effect, um, understanding it and um, being able to predict the weather, and I think I put watching clouds. Honestly, that's a good thing to, a good place to start. The different cloud types, we'll talk about those 10 different types of clouds and kind of what they can mean for weather. So that's what you guys want to know more about. Um, in the meantime, on with this show. So that's my little reminder that we're starting here on Wednesday because <laughs> otherwise I lose track. Um, so when somebody says how, how dense or the density of an object, okay, basically your choices are kind of that that matter is packed together to make it really dense, okay? So if you have a handful, it's like, oh my gosh, have a handful, okay? Or it's got low density, okay? That means that the particles are not packed together very closely, and if you have a handful, you're like, oh, I can handle this. So basically, as I have a handful... What density is, is a little, a little division problem between, between what the mass is and what its volume is. Okay, it's mass divided by volume. Okay. So one of the things you guys already kind of told me, you know, what happens when you climb a mountain to the air? Air gets thinner, air gets thinner yeah. What's that? Yeah, I'm pretty sure you need to... Um, uh, acclimate and or supplement what you're used to, the amount of, of oxygen you need. Exactly. Somebody was um, in my night class was saying when I got to this part that he is trained to climb mountains. You know, he's training. He's dabbled in it. You know, he's not like, hey, I've climbed Mount Everest, okay. Um, but, <laughs> you know, you can adapt to, to climbing. And another student said, you know, if you go to Peru, like the mountains in Peru, that you're supposed to like chillax for a day once you get there before you go sightseeing, otherwise it'll be miserable. Because the air is different density. It's, it's probably right. the similar statement for higher altitude, but with uh, lower altitudes, such as below sea level, if you go to a certain depth, you'll actually have to, uh, it's called the bends. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. You that's can, you come up too, too much pressure that's, or too much. That's it, actually the nitrogen in your place. Atmosphere, yeah. Higher atmosphere will follow yeah. the same thing. Um, or similar protocols? I don't know. I've never heard of, of somebody having issues adjusting, you know, coming down, for instance, uh, down in elevation where they have more abundant oxygen. But, yeah, yeah, it's a similar, it's, it's got, there's some similarities there. I mean, you get pressure, but the bends is because the nitrogen, yeah. you get a buildup of nitrogen in your bloodstream and it comes out too quickly. Is the pressure and it has to do with scuba diving and stuff. Right? Yeah. Higher altitudes, they actually have to stop on the way down. Well, a little periodically. But, my, but my, I think I would like to take the encouraging route. What I like to say is I think we're kind of thinking about it the same way, is that if you go down in the ocean, there's more 
basically, yeah, it's going to be more pressure down there, okay? And if you go down below sea level on land, you know, you dig a hole, yeah, there will be more pressure down there, too. So kind of what we're describing here, um, that chunk of air, okay, um, did I did I miss a slide? You forgot to give it the most density pack on it. This one. Oh, that last bit's kind of cool because some of you guys already know that you can buy compressed air, right? Air is compressible. Gas in general is squeezable, which is a wonderful thing. It's like an accordion. Gas will take any vo any volume you'll give it, but gas can be like oh oh it is. If you take a solid, not so much, right? <laughs> okay, solid, basically, if it's a, a little wooden block, think of a wooden block. I can't compress the solid, okay? I need wood. So, oh, did you guys need this one, too? Um, so, my point was going to be that kind of what you're seeing here is this might be at sea level, level <laughs> spell okay and then this actually is if you're climbing a mountain okay so that's the problem when you get up here the air is thinner look around okay there's less gas particles literally the cool thing though is that um, let me talk about this yet. the cool thing is basically you still have an 80 20 80 20 yeah, yeah 80 20 of course, what's 80? What's 80 percent? What's the gas that you have most of here? Nitrogen. Nitrogen, yep. And that usually, oftentimes, I would put N2. The symbol for nitrogen is N, and it runs around. I know it's kind of hard to see. And it runs around as with two nitro two atoms stuck together. So N2, O2 is 80-20. Okay. So all gas exerts a pressure. And this is where I brought, did I blow up a balloon the other day in here? A balloon, did I blow up a balloon? Okay. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So all, uh, all matter has mass and occupies space. And that sound like an all matter has mass and occupies space, okay. Um, the thing, though, about matter, if it's a gas, and those little particles are supposed to be gas particles, is that not only do they occupy space, but they have a lot of motion. Okay, so if we were to isolate any cute little nitrogen, nit nitrogen gas particle in here, it would be banging around so much in this room. And so actually, if you've been recording the, you know, when you go to do your daily log in here, and if you do the, like the inches, the 30 point something inches, that actually is an indication of the pressure that's banging at the given time. Okay, so I brought this just to kind of, kind of start to thinking about it, but um, I need to stretch this balloon before I blow it up, right? These are water balloons, no wonder. <laughs> My long balloons. All right, I guess people have to do. Yeah, these are very thin. I'll do it this way, okay? Okay, so basically there's, there's, no, there's no gas or no air in here, okay? And what I'm doing basically is adding gas particles. Not bad, okay? So if I go like this, okay, I'm actually, I can feel the gas particles, blah, 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 blah. Okay, they're like confined now, okay? <laughs> I'll just let it go. <laughs> to me, the idea of gases is, a, is one that we take for granted. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we're like, eh, whatever. But we need these gas particles here. And they're, they're thicker at the Earth's atmosphere, and they get thinner as you climb a mountain. Okay. The one thing I, I was going to emphasize, though, I guess here, and that's what these arrows say, is that if you're at the, here the air is thicker. Literally, it's thicker. It's more dense. If you read the barometric pressure, did I bring this out the other day, though? I did, didn't I? Okay, yeah. 
Uh, let's see. Yeah, like I said, I think this one's been squeezed one too many times. I don't think that we really have... That black one is reading, is what the instrument's reading. That gold one, I don't know if I mentioned this the other day, but every time you get one of these, you have a repositional one. The gold one is what you get a twit. You get a twit or you get a spin it. The reason you'd want to use the gold one to basically is to look for tendency. So I can put the gold one there, right? I moved it. I can come back tomorrow, and now, I because I put it to line up with the black one, I can come back, back tomorrow to see where the black one is, to look for tendency. So that's kind of what that's for. But my point was going to be is that if I have he this down here at the ground level, okay, it's going to read high pressure. I go up to a mountain, and literally it's going to read lower pressure. That 31, or 30, excuse me, 30 point something inches. So then is there enough of a difference, say here as at the top of one of the poles that they take it on at the airport, you know what I mean? Oh, well, that's a, a good point. Um, I don't think so. Yeah, she's saying, you know, like if you look at a flagpole and and I think they're really, you know, like is your, is your are they measuring the, the inches of mercury up there instead of here at the right. surface? They're pretty picky about where they put their measuring gizmos and I think it's supposed to be like six feet, okay? okay? So it's a standardized... I just, from the when ground. you think about it, you think about it, how big it's really like on a big giant pool, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. So this says Thursday because this is where I'm going to start Thursday night, uh, tomorrow night, with my night class. Um, if you want to, I'm looking for my pen. On this, if you want to write homework, you can because you're that. Thank you very much, Perry. If, you will need this for your homework, for one of your homeworks. I'll just put HW for homework. Question There's five. question five. Thank you. We talked about this yeah. uh, side. So basically, this we're going to look at some graphs in this class. So let's take a look at what this is saying. Well, along the both of these y axes, you have elevation. Okay, you have elevation in metric kilometers, and you have elevation in miles. We're going up in elevation. Then along here, you have pressure. Now, this, again, you guys are recording pressure in inches. And actually, there's a way to get from inches to MB stands for millibars. Okay, milli, are they cute? Millibars. That's what MB stands for. There's a way to go back and forth between inches and millibars. But this is pressure in millibars, okay? Now, I'm going to go ahead and sometimes... I emphasize this uh, that, and I include it as a test question, at sea level, sea level, normal sea level pressure, actually, I think it's like 1,003 millibars. So it's about 1,000 millibars, normal. Now, pressure is going to change, and we know that, because if the pressure is dropping, eh, pressure dropping tends to give us clouds. Pressure rising, we tend to expect forecast will be clear weather. Pressure steady, what you got is kind of what you're going to keep. So basically, we're here. Notice now, if we climb a mountain, let's go ahead and go to Mount Everest. Okay. Now, on the top of Mount Everest, okay, which, what's the elevation in kilometers for Mount Everest? Well, eight, nine. Let's see, what are those units? I always have to concentrate. Yeah, so that looks like that would be I'd say nine. 10, yeah, that would be 9. I like that, about 9 kilometers. Yep, about nine kilometers. What this red line here is, is basically you track it down and see where it intersects down here along the x-axis. So that's why they say, okay, um, what pressure is that then? 300, I like that. About 300. Does that make sense? It says the pressure. Yeah. yeah. But I was, wanting to, to I was wanting to count it off the go off the chart so people could do this for their homework. Anyway. And then, um, so you got that. Okay. So, um, by the way, that previous graph at the top there, it says kittens are jump. We'll kind of talk about that coming up in a minute. He so actually what? went above the, the kittens jump. I think he said kittens will jump. Kittens are jump, yeah. <laughs> Colonel. Like so, um, one of the things that um, we'll talk more about is what temperature does as you go up in elevation, okay? And it'll be on your test. 
So we're going to talk about layers of the Earth's atmosphere. The layer of the Earth's atmosphere closest to the Earth, and I drew this on the board the other day, is the troposphere. What's above the troposphere? The stratosphere. Very good. The troposphere is the thinnest layer, and it actually varies by where you're at on the Earth. Okay. But basically, and you're going to see it coming up here in a minute, as you go up, the temperature decreases. It gets colder. And you might intuitively say, well, it'll keep getting colder everywhere you are in the Earth's atmosphere, and that's not true. So what I just described here is in the troposphere, the temperatures get colder. And now this slide switches gears. Along the x-axis, we don't have pressure, but along the x-axis, we have temperature. Okay? So that's why it says down here, okay, as you go up in elevation, let me change my color, as you go up in elevation, okay, the temperature gets colder. That's what that is. So I don't think it has it on this slide, although I could do it if it did. But what is the temperature at Mount Everest? About here. -ish. Yeah, ballpark. For me, the whole going into the more negative region kind of drives me nuts. So basically, you kind of make sure you know that you're, you're increasing negativeness as you go to the, to the left there. So yeah, I like that. Negative 45 uh, units would be, in that case, degrees Celsius. Yep, so that's how you read that. Um, very good. So uh, coming up then, we're going to talk a little bit about these other layers. Okay, so I'm probably not going to draw them on the board. It's kind of redundant. But So there are four major layers to the Earth's atmosphere. I'm going to talk about kind of a couple of other layers too. But basically, there's the troposphere, the stratosphere, the mesosphere, and the thermosphere. So notice that they're a little bit drawn to scale. They're drawn to scale because if you look along the x-axis, Okay, I kind of like what your author's done, is it says, how thick is that layer of the Earth's atmosphere? What is the formula for ozone? Good ozone and bad ozone, actually. O3. Very good. So that's the ozone layer that has been depleted by, um, it, by CFCs. Okay. So before we go on to the next slide, here's one for you. Can you see where about, oh, a little above 10 uh, kilometers, as you go up in elevation, okay, what happens to the temperature? It gets warmer. What about as you go up in elevation in the mesosphere? It gets colder. Very good. What about the thermosphere? It gets warmer again. And actually, at some point, we need to talk about when is the Earth's atmosphere no longer the Earth's atmosphere? Okay, when does it peter out? And it kind of comes to, your book tells you, how are you, how, what sparsity, sparsity, are you willing to take um, a gas particle and call it the Earth's atmosphere? Okay, what dilution are you okay with? It just it does kind of peter out a little bit. Okay, so troposphere. Most of this course will be dealing with the troposphere. It's the thinnest because you can kind of see. I'm going to show you how its thickness varies by latitude. Okay. Um, it's the densest because, you know, when you climb a mountain, the air gets thinner. Okay, so it's the densest. Um, the reason we need to spend a lot of time about talking about the troposphere is that actually... It is the major player when it comes to weather. Most um, of the clouds, um, the, the 10 types of clouds, um, I'd say 98% of them are confined to the troposphere. And we'll be talking more about temperature regions, excuse me, temperature inversions later. But as you go up, it gets colder. And the reason it gets colder as you go up, there's always a reason, right? is that the geosphere, okay, geosphere, okay, 
is a great um, sucker up of energy from the sun. And then actually when it kind of rotates, this is the way I think of it, actually when it rotates away from the sun, your location is nighttime basically, okay, that thermal energy it got from the sun, it kind of oozes it back out again. It re-oozes it back out again when the, during the daytime too. But that re-emitting of energy, heat energy from the geosphere is so important to the atmosphere. And the thing is, is you go up, in elevation, like if you take a weather or take a balloon up, okay, you're getting farther from your heat source, so that's why it gets colder. Okay, so we're gonna spend a fair bit of time in either unit two or unit three when we talk about clouds. It's really important to get a fix on what, how is the temperature changing as you go up in elevation. And here in a minute, I'm gonna show you a, a video of a weather balloon. And as it, as it rises, it sends back data. What's the temperature doing? So um, in general, by the way, what the weather balloon tells us is called the environmental lapse rate, or the ELR. There's all sorts of little acronyms. Okay. So environmental lapse rate, our weather balloon will tell us what's going on. Usually for every one kilometer you rise, it gets colder six and a half degrees Celsius, okay, usually. That's what the weather balloon's for. Speaking of weather balloon, so the weather balloon goes up and you can see those four things that it uh, takes as it, okay. So the, the, the troposphere is we're going to talk a lot more about, and that's where our weather occurs, basically. In the troposphere, I said its height varies, and this is showing you how its height varies. Um, so what you have here is kind of that kink is where that kink is this transition right here. Okay, so basically, wherever you see a kink, above it is the stratosphere, strat, and below it is the troposphere, trope. Okay, so that, thus you can see that the troposphere is thickest in the tropics and the troposphere is thinnest at the poles. Okay, so stratosphere. Stratosphere is above the troposphere and we do have some cloud action in the... Um, a little bit of cloud action. Those polar stratospheric clouds were in the stratosphere. It's thicker than the troposphere. And, um, let's see, when, I think it must have been on the previous slide, but where one ends and the other begins at the top of the troposphere is the tropopause, yeah. And so, not so surprisingly, there is a stratopause etc. And actually you can know that you've reached a new layer if you check out what the temperature is doing. Because we said the temperature will begin to um, get warmer as you go up in the stratosphere. Yeah. yeah. Why does it get warmer in the stratosphere? And this kind of talks about where your mini radiator is. Actually is that good ozone layer right here. This is your O3 layer, the good one. Okay, and it actually acts as a mini radiator. So, um, so I don't have a lot to say about the stratosphere and even less about the, the meso and the thermosphere. There actually are some clouds that are in the mesosphere. They're very pretty. Noctilucent clouds, yeah. I've never seen them. They look, kind of have that pearly look to them like the polar stratospheric mm -hmm. clouds have. Noctilucent clouds. Um, so the mesosphere is like the troposphere in that what they have in common is that as you go up in elevation, it gets uh, colder. So the mesosphere is wider. I'll just put meso, meso, okay, and it gets colder as you go up. Goodness. Same as this one. 
And then above the mesosphere would be the thermosphere, where basically the Earth's atmosphere kind of peters out. It's the um, the 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 edge of the of the thermosphere, I would say, is kind of uh, kind of rough. <laughs> the edge is kind of rough. Um, so to me, if you're leaving the Earth's atmosphere, you're kind of going into outer space, right? So then your question almost becomes, what is the temperature in just miscellaneous outer space? And if you Google that, basically they're going to tell you that it kind of depends on your proximity to a star. Okay? And the other thing about being in outer space, what your temperature is, is um, things can only have a temperature, read a temperature, if there's, only, if there's any mass there. <laughs> so honestly, the temperature of nothing is nothing. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, so it's kind of an interesting thought. So um, I have a video here of the Kittinger jump. Did I? Where did my... All right, I guess it was. Where did my... Uh... I usually had a thing that said um, the... There it is. This is what I was looking for. So granted, it's a um, Wikipedia, which I said don't use Wikipedia, but I think they got this right. I think they got a lot of things right. But don't ever use Wikipedia. But um, do you guys remember the uh, Felix Baumgartner thing? Okay, Basically, he jumped higher than this Kittinger guy. Kittinger uh, was the name that was on referred to on a slide said, where did he jump from? Okay, and actually, um, much to the chagrin probably of his mother, uh, Felix Baumgartner jumped even higher than that. So if you read this, um, it will talk about his jumps, okay, and how crazy it is. So see if this, I click here, it makes it larger. So you can kind of see, we've been talking about the troposphere, on top of the tropospheres, the tropopause, stratosphere, stratopause, stratopause, etc. Um, and there are just some interesting pieces of information here. Kittinger, I referred to, um, I think Air Force, um, that these dots are where he jumped from, and these dots are where, um, I think I'll go ahead and, yeah, because I don't show you that video, but... I think I have linked to that video in my YouTube things. But let's look then, as we get time, at the old dude jump. Because I, I like the, the filming. I think he did, they did a good job here. Metal, metal ball. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. I think that's what it looks like yeah. to me, too. It's interesting. Okay, so just a few more slides. Um, one is to talk about um, the ionosphere. And I know in my other class in astronomy, I talk a fair bit about the Van Allen radiation belts. And to me, that actually, there's some, some overlap here. But the ionosphere, actually fortunate for us, is good at um, trapping and holding charged particles from the sun that otherwise would make the Earth sterile, basically. That radiation is not good for life, too much radiation. So, but what can happen is if the sun's extra rambunctious, it can basically have, um, it overloads what the ionosphere or those Van Allen belts can accommodate. And if that's the case, then basically what can happen is the, um, the overload of the particles, charged particles, they aren't gonna fall just any willy-nilly. They actually are going to fall where the, our magnetic field is the weakest or the thinnest or where it originates. Um, we have a north pole, north mag magnetic north and magnetic south. It doesn't entirely coincide with the, the Earth's axis. Like the north pole is not necessarily the Earth's magnetic north pole, but it's close right now. So basically here where it's weak, then we get those charged particles that fall, that kind of cascade through. And as they cascade through, when the, when the sun's kind of been extra rambunctious, they create um, this uh, energy, light energy that we see, we call northern lights. Okay. 
So it is definitely localized. So one last slide then for this chapter is this one. So we spent a lot of time kind of dividing up, um, looking at kind of these, these horizontal layers of the Earth's atmosphere and the troposphere, stratosphere, then mesosphere and thermosphere. But another way to divide it up actually in, um, and I guess I added this figure from when I printed these out. So another way to divide it up is um, the, um, the homosphere and the heterosphere, okay? And so over here, it's gone ahead and kind of shown you here close to the Earth, oops, I want to go back. Here close to the Earth's surface, it's pretty mixed. Okay, so I'm going to put mixed. Okay, then as you go up in elevation, okay, beginning, um, this is showing kind of the mesosphere and up, then you get kind of a layered effect by weight. Um, actually, nitrogen is the heaviest. Okay, so that's kind of, and if something, if you have a mixture that's not mixed like this up here, when things, when you start to have kind of a nitrogen, oxygen, helium, and hydrogen sort of thing, then we call that hetero, a heterogeneous mixture. Okay, so that's the heterogeneous. I think we're okay with all that. So since we got through chapter one, chapter one assignment, like I said, is due on Friday. Thank you. There, I usually um, say a hint, remember that figure, I said HW homework, but I'll do is kind of have a little recording or a drawing to kind of give you hints about the whole three, the whole breaths thing. Okay, climbing a mountain, how many extra breaths would you need to take if you go up in elevation the air is thinner. Okay, so I'll kind of either make a figure or a video and I'll push it out on Twitter. Okay? Alrighty, guys. Have a good one. See you on Friday. The other thing about your homework is it's due by 3 p.m. So if you come to class and you're like, hey, can you help me with this question? Then probably like a little before class or a little after class, I'll talk to you and then you can finish it and then handle your homework. Um, that's what's nice about a not br break a dawn class. <laughs>